Simulation tools fall into several categories since people can often be unaware of the differences among the tools or even the existence of them. We'll cover the facets of the major categories. Kinematic tools like Siemens Technomatics Robcat and Process Simulate Robotics let you analyze the real-time motion of robotic work cells, optimize cycle times, optimize welding sequences, and increase process quality. Ergonomic tools like Jack and Process Simulate Human let you analyze human motion and optimize the ergonomics of human operation to enhance worker efficiency and minimize injuries. Note that the focus here is on the actual motions that a worker makes in order to complete a task. So the benefits of this tool are a healthier, happier workforce, as well as reduced cost of workers on disability leave. Computer-aided engineering tools like NXCAE let you analyze specialized items like thermal and flow analysis and finite element analysis early in the design process. This results in better performing products, so the big value here is a higher quality product. Computer-aided manufacturing tools like NXCAM let you analyze specialized items like tool design, NC programming, feature-based machining, and collision detection. This automates the developments of molds, dyes, and fixtures which improve quality, reduce cost, and improves machining time. Pedestrian flow tools like pedestrian dynamics and AnyLogic model the behavior of people moving on sidewalks, stairs, and escalators, etc., in stores, stadiums, airports, etc., in normal and evacuation scenarios. The pedestrians are aware of others, alternative pathways and obstacles going around them. Like in the real world, their behavior is random, including walking at different speeds, going around obstacles in different ways, passing each other, etc. The benefits here include greater safety, reduced cost, and improved throughput of people through a facility. Production scheduling tools like Somatic Preactor and Ortems specialize in optimizing schedules. Very fast specialized algorithms provide quick results. Unlike the other tools listed here, you don't see a visualization of reality. Instead, the interface lets you quickly adjust schedules with a drag-drop interface. Add or subtract overtime hours, measure impact of new or rush orders, reallocate resources, etc. You can also backward schedule to a bottleneck and forward schedule from it. And unlike the other simulation tools that are used infrequently, primarily during the design of an existing facility or an update, scheduling tools are often used daily, weekly, or monthly to make operational decisions. But they don't include the realistic stochastic processing fluctuations and downtimes that are in the other tools. As opposed to the first four categories that focus on individual work cells, individual workers, or products, discrete event tools like FlexSim, Simulate, and Technomatics Plant Simulation let you analyze the operation of an entire department or facility and optimize overall items like throughput, buffer or inventory sizes, scheduling, and workers. Although all these tools are really cool, our main focus here is on discrete event simulation and more specifically how this type of tool allows you to optimize workstations, lines, whole plants on up to an entire enterprise consisting of more than one facility. Finally, continuous flow simulation models the flow of fluids through pipes, tanks, portioners, etc. It is often included in discrete event products. Models can be purely fluids, purely discrete event, or a mix of the tool types. The value of continuous simulation is the same as discrete event simulation. Our next topic covers the traditional discrete event benefits that have been available for years. They'll be covered quickly so we can concentrate on the newer goodies. Being able to locate bottlenecks and break them with what-if games in discrete event tools to increase throughput 
has been used since the pre-personal computer dinosaur days of the big mainframe computers, and it's a huge benefit. Similarly, inventory can be minimized, which decreases costs and improves quality. Similarly, labor can be minimized, which decreases cost. Schedule optimization has also been done traditionally. And the addition of 2D computer graphics and animations provided a wonderful way to show people how a planned facility or proposed change facility will work. It also provided another way to verify that a model is running properly. This helps to ensure the quality of the model. Our final major item is not uncommon, 12 to 1 return on investment in discrete event simulation. Even bigger returns are frequent, as well as lesser returns. Even if the returns are small or even non-existent, the simulation can prove that a facility is already highly optimized and it provides that great improved communication benefit. The last statement on the previous slide is based on this Siemens study that was done a few years back. Our next topic covers some of the newer discrete event features and benefits. I'm sure you agree that competition is good. Unlike too many categories of software that are stagnant monopolies, the number of discrete event software products like AutoMod, FlexSim, and Technomatics PlantSim and others shown here ensures that they are in a good old-fashioned muscle car-like race to continuously improve their products, including new features, improved performance, user friendliness, and bug removal, which benefits simulation models, modelers, users, and viewers. I've used a few different discrete event products in the past, but my personal tool of choice for several years has been Technomatics Plant Simulation, so the examples here will be using that tool. Not too long ago, computers were too slow and their memory too limited to allow simulations to include 3D. I'm among the simulation veterans who sometimes miss those days. Most simulation experts would agree that 3D is often nothing but fluff from a simulation analysis and verification viewpoint. But in my experience, more end users are demanding 3D, and the discrete event software companies have allowed us to provide it. To satisfy the hunger of the 3D fans out there, we'll show a five-minute video that shows off the 3D capabilities of Technomatics plant simulation. This is a 3D view of plant simulation's Factory 51 example model running at a slow speed. At left, a forklift unloads pallets of parts from incoming trucks. The parts are then moved via crane, robots, and conveyors to two identical production areas named P1 and P2, where the parts are processed at several stations. Automated guided vehicles move the finished products out of the production areas. The products are then moved via robots and conveyors to the high bay warehouse at the right. Finally, products are moved from the warehouse and loaded into the outgoing trucks at right. The incoming trucks deliver pallets with four boxes on them. A forklift unloads a pallet from the truck and moves it to the front crane. The crane moves pallets to a staging area and or moves the pallets to a pair of robots that unload eight boxes onto conveyors that lead to the two identical production areas. Robots to the left of the production areas pick up the three parts from the boxes and place them on the rear conveyors that feed the three parallel processing stations at the rear of the production areas. The boxes are placed on a conveyor that moves them to the finished product area at far right of the production area. This is a zoomed in view of the front production area. Workers carry parts from the three polishing stations at the left rear of the production area to three parallel milling stations across from them. Workers then load the parts in the milling stations. Conveyors move the parts from the milling stations through two parallel pairs of painting and drying booths. A conveyor moves the painted parts to the right through a clear coat booth and a drying booth. Conveyors move the parts to three parallel three-step 
post-processing mines. Repair workers walk up and down stairs to these automatic stations and to the robots to make repairs when they go down. The finished parts are moved via conveyors to the front two robots at the right of the production area. The robots pack three parts into boxes, then move the boxes via conveyors to the rear robot that places two boxes on AGVs, automatic guided vehicles. Also, every 10 parts are moved to a lift which delivers the parts to the quality control area at the rear of the second floor where they go through a three-step inspection process. Repair workers walk up and down stairs to make repairs to these stations when they go down. This is a zoomed-in view of a station. It includes a color-coded light bar that indicates the state that the station is in, just like many stations have in the real world. Blank means the station is waiting for a part. Green means it is working. Yellow means it is blocked. Red means it is down, etc. The AGVs move finished parts to two parallel robots at the right of the production area near the rear. The robots unload the two boxes from the AGV. The boxes are moved via conveyor to two parallel robots near the rear wall which loads four boxes on small pallets. Also, AGVs move to a charging station when their batteries are low. The pallets are moved via conveyor to the high bay warehouse, which is an automatic storage retrieval system at the rear of the far right side of the model. Pallets arrive at the warehouse via conveyor. They are then stored in the warehouse by an automatic storage retrieval system. They are then retrieved from the warehouse by the automatic storage retrieval system and moved via conveyor to the shipping trucks. I think you'll agree that this model is a perfect example of a case where 3D adds value. Since the entire scene can be rotated, you can get overall views of the entire simulation from different angles. You can see different floor and conveyor levels at the same time the lift going up to the right side of the second floor quality area, cranes moving left and right, to and fro and up and down, conveyors, trucks, forklifts, AGVs, robots, and a high bay warehouse moving pallets, boxes, and parts. And you can quickly zoom in for the details like seeing the individual boxes on pallets or parts and boxes. Because of the complexities in this model, 3D is not only useful for displaying the simulation, but for visually verifying the model, especially the material handling. Okay, one gotcha with 3D, however. 3D CAD files can be very large. Often they are bloated with features that are not necessary for visualization in your simulation, but necessary for other types of analysis and other tools. But they can be trimmed down, often dramatically, without affecting the look in your model. This speeds up runtime performance. So if you're getting into 3D, I'd highly recommend that if you're doing it or somebody else is doing it, make sure that they're optimizing these 3D CAD files, unless they're trivially small. So 3D CAD files can be trimmed within the CAD software that built it itself or separate optimization software. This example was done with the plant simulations built-in optimized graphics feature that lets you quickly perform various optimizations and preview the results. Here the selected optimizations stripped out some color but retained the quality of the overall look. Substantial reductions were, were done here including a 17 percent reduction in model file size Often the results are even a lot more dramatic, resulting in just a small fraction of the original complexity and size with virtually no noticeable change in the visualization itself. So visual quality is maintained while improving runtime performance and reducing model file sizes. Laser scanning of facilities that produce very detailed 3D point cloud files have become very, quite popular. The cool thing about these is that everything, down to the most tiny feature, is exactly placed and rendered. 
PlantSim does a remarkable job of quickly initially loading and rendering point cloud files, which are usually extremely large. This is an example of a point cloud that was imported into plant simulation. The resolution is enough to show the concept, but not quite as nice looking as it can be. Here's a view that zoomed in deep into the point cloud where you can read the number 25 on the ivory pillar on the left and the word Lova Weld on the blue canister. Note that a higher res scan would result in even more quality. So, what can you do with the point cloud once it's in PlantSim? Well, you can use it as a 3D template for placing your modeling objects. For example, you can position a plant simulation station object in 3D space so that when a part is in it, the part appears in the correct location of a machine in the point cloud. The trick is to make plant simulation station transparent, which is very easy to do, so users don't see it but allow the part to be displayed. So you don't have to import individual 3D images into station objects that represent the machines. You can do this trick with the conveyor too. Chris Mounts is one of my co-workers at PMC. He's an expert in laser scanning with a lot of experience. He made the video whose link is on this slide and it has invaluable advice for anyone seeking laser scanning. It isn't PMC specific, but it has a lot of good tips in there if you're interested in, in laser scanning. Chris says that there are a lot of people doing laser scanning out there, some of whom are great, some of whom who do not have the skills, experience, and our equipment to do non-trivial work like scanning large facilities. There is some poor quality work being done out there, like bad data being included in the point clouds, resulting in things like portions of the point cloud being shifted instead of in the correct places. These mistakes can be hard to find and can cause days of extra work. So just be careful when selecting a vendor to do any laser scanning for you. And watch out for unusually tiny bids compared to others. You'll probably get what you pay for. Can anyone guess why I have a game computer instead of an engineering workstation? Well, a couple of years ago, I had a client who had a large model that required importing numerous large 3D CAD files for numerous stations. After adding a lot of the files and optimizing them in the model, my powerful workstation laptop started bogging down. It got to the point where that computer couldn't handle anymore. So I had to get a more powerful computer. After looking at the graphics cards available from a company like NVIDIA, I learned the hard way that engineering workstations focus on high-end processors but do not offer the higher-end graphics cards. So I ended up with a game computer that had a much faster graphics card with a lot more graphics memory and that I had no problem modeling that client with all that big 3D stuff. So there's a good chance that you'll never face this problem, but I thought I'd warn you about what can happen if you come up against the kind of brick wall that I did. Besides workstation laptops not offering the higher-end graphics boards, gaming laptops do not offer several of the highest-end boards that you can install in a desktop computer. So don't overlook the desktop computer option. With me, the decision was simple because I needed the portability of a laptop. For the first several years of my work with simulation, I used tools that could only make flat models and did not have the key features shown here. When I first had to switch to plant simulation in 2006, I was skeptical since it didn't have a few features I was used to in other tools. But the more I used plant simulation, the more I liked it. Object orientation provides intuitive use of powerful built-in and custom-made objects that let you build and maintain models quicker. Hierarchy lets you structure complex models in an intuitive manner. It also makes it easier for you to make changes without having to tediously rearrange things like another flat structured products require. Inheritance lets you make changes in one place called the parent object or class. All children or subclasses of the parent are changed accordingly. This ensures quality and saves you a lot of time. 
There are many advantages of these features that I would never consider a tool that does not have them. So I'd highly recommend if you're looking at looking for a good tool to look at all the competition and keep in mind the huge advantages of these features that aren't necessarily noticeable when you first look at a product. We'll use the Factory 51 example model that I showed in the video to show how the key features was used to build that model. First of all, the class library at the left shows just how object-oriented plant simulation is. The first six folders contain all the built-in objects. The library manager lets you remove or add objects here. The last two folders contain user-made objects, including low-level and high-level modeling objects in the user objects folder and models in the models folder. Note that I use the plural form of model here because PlantSim has a nice capability of letting you have several models in one file. This is a very nice way to keep all your tweaked what-if models in one place. You can easily add delete folders at the root level or make subfolders like the MUs for moving units folders. Let's, this lets you organize your objects. And you can quickly make duplicates or derived objects of your our children of the parent object, which inherit any changes you make in the parent. This is one of the many powerful features that I've grown to love. This slide shows how the two production areas were added to the model. They were just drag dropped from the production object in the class library. You can tell they are objects because clicking anywhere in the production area highlights the object. This slide shows hierarchy. The second production object at the rear named P2 is at the top level of the model, while all the equipment, stairs, walls are inside the object. This appears when you double click on the object. Note that this object was made transparent, so at the top level you can see those objects that are in there. If this model had been made without hierarchy, to make the second production area, you could copy all the objects in the area, but every single object would have to have a unique name, and moving the production areas around would mean highlighting numerous objects instead of just one high level. So this demonstrates the tremendous advantage of objects orientation and hierarchy. Cost modeling is another feature that is now often included with discrete event simulation software. This gives you the ability to factor in cost into your optimization goals. In plant simulation, the cost tab appears in the material flow objects, non-length objects like the station, assembly station, and robot have three fields, depreciation period, investment costs, and operating costs. Length-oriented objects like conveyors and tracks have two more costs per length fields. And parts and containers have a material cost per piece field. The cost analyzer gathers costs. The corresponding HTML report shows total costs for the whole model, total costs and subframes of the hierarchy, and the individual costs for objects, parts, and containers. A few years ago, energy modeling analysis features were added to plant simulation. I believe this was an industry first. The new energy tab appears with the other tabs and several objects that PlantSim provides to model stations, conveyors, and robots. This lets you model the dynamic energy management available in modern control units like Siemens S7300 using the Prof Energy protocol without any custom programming, so you can easily experiment with energy what-if scenarios in a virtual environment to minimize your energy usage. The left side shows that you specify the power input in kilowatts required for a station's various states, like when it's setting up, working, failed, or down, or standby. The right side lets you specify the transition times between energy states like operational to standby. The state transition button even lets you model the saving of energy specifying energy state transitions for pauses or breaks within shifts or when a new shift starts after an off shift period. You can even choose to power up early so that the machine is fully operational immediately after breaks or when a new shift starts after an off shift period. This lets you save energy without decreasing throughput one bit. 
The energy analyzers show visualization option lets you quickly pinpoint energy bottlenecks that are areas of high energy use. Objects like stations, conveyors, and robots with the highest energy consumption are surrounded by a solid red circle. Open red circles have slightly less consumption. Purple circles are intermediate consumption, and blue circles are the lowest consumption, so you can quickly pinpoint the most energy usage in your model at one glance. The Energy Analyzer Objects Display Panel option displays overall energy statistics for the whole simulation, including total energy consumption in kilowatt hours and total energy consumption while in the operational or waiting state, as well as the current power in kilowatts and the maximum power. The Energy Analyzer's Diagram of the Energy Consumption option displays a graph that shows the kilowatt hours that each station consumed while in various states like working, operational, and standby. And the Standard Resources Statistics Time and State chart includes a powering up down state. Like the built-in tools that help you to find and break bottlenecks to increase throughput, the energy tools help you to find and break energy bottlenecks, which decreases cost. Setup and ramp up of the systems implementation for robotics and automation is called commissioning. Traditionally, this step is done after the physical system is built on the shop floor. Virtual commissioning, also called emulation, lets you test and optimize commissioning during the planning and design phase instead of during setup and ramp up time in a virtual environment that takes into account equipment like robots, PLCs, conveyors, light barriers, etc. without any risk to the real facility. During doing this cuts typical setup and ramp up time from four to five weeks to one to one and a half weeks. In other words, time to job one is reduced and problems can be addressed before production starts. Discrete event simulation is a very powerful tool that can optimize an entire facility without including commissioning. But the discrete event tools that offer virtual commissioning tools like plant simulation ensures that the overall material flow and operation of a facility works smoothly with components like PLCs, conveyors, light barriers, etc. Virtual commissioning features let plant sims send and receive control logic signals to and from the PLCs. The photo shows a typical setup. On the left is the control panel for the PLC. On the right is the plant simulation model. This is an ideal setup since the PLC is not yet full connected to the plant floor, so you can check out and tweak your control logic virtually before going live in the plant. One of my clients used this to check that the PNC control logic worked for their factory's conveyor system, which had numerous light sensors and stops along the way where parts would wait for certain conditions before moving on. They were especially concerned about an interesting past problem where a standalone discrete event simulation showed that their control logic worked, but when the plant was built, Throughput was a lot less than what the simulation predicted. The problem was that the simulation implemented slightly different control logic, so the problem didn't occur in the simulation. Now they can interface plant simulation with the PLC so that the exact control logic from the PLC controls things like the simulated stops on the conveyor to ensure accuracy. While discrete event virtual commissioning addresses overall factory commissioning issues, kinematic tools that include virtual commissioning, like process simulate robotics, addresses cell and line level issues. Besides being a very powerful generic tool that can optimize the work cells robotics programming and ergonomics without commissioning, Process Simulate's virtual commissioning tool ensures that automation equipment like robots work smoothly with control components like PLCs. Those of you who have modeled material handling that includes parts going back for rework job shops with parts being rotated back and forth from the several stations, etc., may have encountered deadlock situation where parts are waiting for other parts to get out of the way, which in turn are waiting for those parts to get out of their way. Or maybe there's some other bug in your simulation that does not appear until several hours a day.
Thanks to time compression, when these things happen, you can fairly quickly reset and run the simulation near the point where the problem happens in order to diagnose what went wrong. The problem with virtual commissioning is that we are dealing with real time. So in order to diagnose a problem that happens around 30 hours would mean we'd have to run the simulation for a bit less than 30 hours each time we try to diagnose exactly what's going on at that point in time. When I encountered this type of problem, I experimented with speeding up the simulation runtime. By tweaking the real-time clock scale factor, I was able to run the simulation a bit faster, but still at the wait hours because if you speed up the clock too much, it can't keep up with the sending and receiving of signals. Just imagine how this could really mess you up if you are on a tight budget and tight time frame. I didn't want to scare you with this, but I just wanted, I wanted to warn you what could possibly happen so that you allocate enough time when you're estimating the time required to do these jobs. Most of the time you'll finish early, but if you encounter a problem like this, it could take you a little bit of time to debug. Another gotcha is that virtual commissioning sends signals to and from the discrete event model and the PLCs. Although this happens very fast, it is not done in zero time. The delay time is called latency. So if your project has a lot of signals, you could get to the point where the simulation cannot keep up with all the signals in time. With today's tools, I don't know when this point gets reached, but you want to be aware that this could happen. All discrete event simulation models, workstations, buffers, and offer material handling equipment like conveyors, forklifts, AGVs, and cranes. But not all models include workers. To paraphrase Shakespeare's Hamlet character, to model or not to model workers? That is the question. The answer depends on how workers are utilized in the current or proposed process. We'll cover some rules of thumb to help you in making uh, your decision-making process. If workers are known to not be bottlenecks, then workers do not have to be modeled. Obviously, if all stations are totally automated, then workers do not have to be modeled. If workers are dedicated to working at just one station, then they do not have to be modeled. If cycle times are relatively long compared to the time it takes for workers to walk to stations, then they do not have to be modeled. On the other hand, if workers are a known bottleneck, for example, a layoff resulted in stations waiting for workers, then the workers should be modeled. If workers work at more than one station by traveling between them, then the workers should be modeled since the likelihood of a station waiting for a worker is greatly increased, except in the case where the cycle times are very large compared to the workers' travel time. If you wish to optimize worker productivity by playing what-if games, then the workers should be modeled. Games include experimenting with allowing workers to work at more than one station, creating a new pool of workers who can work at a set of stations, working overtime, adding shifts, or working during weekends. If you want workers to appear in your simulation, then the workers should be modeled. A couple of my clients added workers to their model purely to let managers and executives see where workers work versus automatic stations. There are a few ways to model workers, but not all discrete event simulation tools have all four ways that we'll be looking at here. Since Technomatics Plant Simulation has all these options, it will be used in the example screens you see here. Each way requires that a pool of workers is included in the model. The worker pool object specifies how many of each type of worker will be available for the workstations that have been set up to require given types of services, like requiring a worker named worker who performs standard services by working during setup and cycle times, and another worker named repair who performs repairs. The work remotely option is the easiest to implement. All you have to do is check the workers can work remotely checkbox, then workers will work right from the worker pool. This method is perfect for facilities where worker walking times are not important to the model. For example, where cycle times are a lot longer than the time it takes for workers to walk to a station. But visualization is limited to just seeing up to four color-coded workers on the worker pool icon. 
Note that the worker icons are color-coded. Green means working and blue means not working. As you can see in the screenshot above, two workers are working remotely at stations one and two, which are both working on the blue-colored parts inside the stations, and two workers are not working. The Beam 2 option is similar to the Work Remote option since walking times are not modeled, but it provides nice visualization since color-coded workers appear at workplaces so you can put anywhere on the screen, usually close to the stations, as shown in the screenshot above. Note, in 2D, workplaces are gray when there is no worker present, as shown in the screenshot above for the Work 3 workplace above Station 3. They are green when a worker is worker during the cycle times as shown for stations 1 or 2, or when doing repair work as shown for station 3. They are blue when a worker is present but not working as in the repair workplaces for stations 1 and 2 above. In 3D, the stations as well as the workers appear in 3D. This method is also perfect for facilities where worker working times are not important to the model. Instead of working immediately when required, as in the work remotely and beam two options, the walk along footpaths option includes the time it takes for workers to walk to and from the stations. But this option requires more modeling time since you add footpaths that provide a path for workplace to workplace, as shown in the screenshots above. The four footpaths appear in dark gray in 2D and light gray in 3D. On the other hand, this option lets you play what-if games like optimizing the paths workers take from a distance and safety perspective to minimize the likelihood of accidents with material handling equipment for example. And yes, in 3D, the workers' feet even move as they walk. Also, workers can carry parts from and to stations. Move freely is a unique, powerful new worker option that was added to version 13 of plant simulation. Like the footpath option, walking time is modeled, but workers are not restricted to fixed footpaths. Instead, they move freely. They take the shortest path to their destination station. So this option is quicker to model if you don't need walkers to walk along specified footpaths. And yes, they walk around obstacles like the standard objects that represent stations, buffers, conveyors, etc. And you can even add 3D building features like fences and columns and specify them as obstacles that workers will work, walk around. On the other hand, since the worker automatically takes the shortest path with the Move Freely option, you can't play what-if games for paths that workers use like you can with the footpath option. So all of these have their place. We've included tips and gotchas in the presentation. We will conclude with helpful lists to help you increase throughput by finding and breaking bottlenecks. So, how do you break a bottleneck? You look at the simulation output statistics like percent working and percent blocked and look for clues. You could look at the detailed statistic report of individual stations as in above. Better yet, you can use other tools that help pinpoint bottlenecks faster like time and state charts or plant simulations unique bottleneck analyzer that slash the time to locate bottlenecks. One clue of a bottleneck is a station with the lowest block time. Another is lowest waiting time, also called starve time. Highest working time. Upstream buffers mostly full. Downstream buffers mostly empty. Upstream workstations blocked and downstream workstations waiting or starved. There are several ways to break bottlenecks and increase throughput. Which ones that are possible and cost effective for your company depends on your unique situation. For example, if your existing system or design is not optimized, sometimes a relatively simple improvement can make a dramatic increase in throughput. At the other extreme, if you are already highly optimized, you might have to implement several improvements sprinkled throughout your system to get a decent throughput improvement. One possibility is to redesign your process to improve efficiency. For example, moving a station closer to a source of resources like parts, tools, or workers automating an inefficient manual operation, or moving some work from one station to another. 
decreasing the processing time of the bottleneck can sometimes be done if it's possible to do and or doesn't affect downtimes too much. Purchasing a faster machine is also a possibility. Similarly, decreasing the bottleneck's downtime or repair time can sometimes be done, perhaps through scheduled off-shift maintenance or purchasing a more reliable machine. If a setup is required at the bottleneck, you can look into decreasing that time, perhaps by adding another worker, streamlining the setup process or purchasing equipment that requires less frequent or easier setups. If the bottleneck has a high rework and or scrap rate, you can look into decreasing those by purchasing more reliable equipment, switching from a manual to an automatic operation, or perhaps changing your process. If the bottleneck cannot be improved enough and space permits, adding a second parallel station may do the trick. If the bottleneck stations require workers, you may be able to speed things up by adding another worker to a shift or adding a part-time shift with fewer workers. Similarly, you might be able to increase throughput by increasing buffer size. If your process includes the production of different models or types of products, then changing how they are scheduled may increase throughput. Technomatics plant simulation is the perfect tool to help you to not just optimize your system through what-if games with the above possibilities, but to identify the main bottleneck in the first place. As you may know, optimizing a non-bottleneck is a frequent and often costly mistake, so bottleneck identification is also important. At worst, PlantSim can verify that your system is already highly optimized and that further improvements may not be worth the cost. Also, it's a wonderful way to teach or show others how your facility operates.